All right. Hi, everyone. Again, this is Stephen Bell from Temple University Libraries here in Philadelphia. I want to welcome everyone. I love these Library 2.0 conferences, and there's some really great stuff happening today. So thank you for choosing this session. I want to start by acknowledging the San Jose State University iSchool, our conference sponsor and founding partner of Library 2.0 mini conference series. Thank you, big thumbs up to San Jose State University iSchool. I actually teach as an adjunct for these folks and they are just great to work with and it's amazing that they sponsor these conferences. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining again for this session on library leadership. And first, I applaud your interest in this topic. And here is the first thing that I want to say about library leadership. Now, I authored a regular column for Library Journal on library leadership for approximately five years. Just stopped writing it at the end of 2019. And I wrote it not as a leadership guru or thinking I was some sort of leadership expert, but my goal was to help everyone, including myself, to commit to being a better leader at whatever level you lead, whether that's a dean, a director, middle manager, a committee or task force leader, or even an informal grassroots leader in your organization. If you have led at any of those levels, you know that leadership is hard work. It takes time to develop good leadership skills. It can be a steep learning curve and you will make mistakes and you will experience your own personal leadership crucibles and know that it is a lifelong pursuit. Now in this particular column I'm showing here, I tried to bring attention to the difficulties of being a leader and I tried to make a case that library workers should recognize that it's hard work. They should remember it and as we heard, be kind to yourself, but maybe sometimes you need to be kind to your leaders as well. Now that said, I'm very concerned about a problem that I have observed about library leadership, and one that I think is getting worse and not better. In this session, I'm gonna cover three things. First, I will address the issue of failing library leadership. Second, I will identify three core areas that constitute what I will refer to as human leadership. And third, I will share five soft skills. And no doubt there are some others that you will think are critical, but just five for today that I think will allow us to be more humanistic leaders and to lead with from our hearts. You can use the chat space to and Twitter to share your ideas, comments, and questions. And we'll see what we can get to at the end of the session when we take those questions. Yes. We do indeed have a problem. It is a leadership problem. Over the past year or two, I have become increasingly concerned about the state of leadership in the library profession. In our professional literature and on social media, I'm seeing more evidence that library workers are disengaged, experiencing low morale, lack confidence and trust in their leaders. And I'm hearing this anecdotally firsthand. I will say at ALA 2020 Midwinter, I heard one of the worst change management leadership stories ever about a leader who basically forced a change on staff when so many people were, did not feel comfortable with it. Now, I was only hearing one side of the story, but it was very concerning nonetheless. Now, to be sure, we do have good and even great leaders in our profession. But I'm worried that those leaders are too few and far between and that despite all of our library leadership and our leadership development programs and our leadership academies, we are finding that for a whole host of reasons that our leadership and librarianship is broken and failing. So our leaders must do better. The Gallup poll on employee engagement is a time tested and reliable source of information about the degree of employee engagement in the United States. And I think it, it is applicable to other countries as well. While the 2018 survey indicated that employee engagement increased primarily owing to the overall increase in employment, you can see that the levels of employee engagement still remain incredibly low with too few workers reporting positive workplace engagement. And I think that's a problem that we're seeing in live librarianship and the role of leadership in establishing a workplace culture that builds and supports employee engagement is not where it needs to be. And there's two library research articles that tell us something about that problem. Now you may know the research by academic librarian Katrina Davis Kendrick on low staff morale among academic librarians. 
Through, though this research is based on interviews with a small population of 21 academic librarians, it points to the existence of a serious morale problem in librarianship. There are far more anecdotal examples from librarians on social media and at conference sessions when personal experiences are shared. Now on the left, I highlight text from a library journal interview with Kendrick on the problem of low morale. And she shares my observation that the research supports what we're hearing anecdotally. While leadership failure and dysfunction is far from the only contributor to low morale in libraries, in Kendrick's article, it states that respondents reported that administrative or managerial incompetence is by far the most significant cause of low morale triggers. This is especially critical because the research she did shows that racial and ethnic minorities experience emotional and systemic abuse and negligence at much higher rates than other workers. So it's up to library leaders to take action to promote the type of workplace culture and working conditions that will help to eliminate the type of hostility and abuse documented in Kendrick's research. There's another research article by Jason Martin that focuses on workplace engagement among library workers. It supports the contention that there is evidence of a lack of workplace engagement in libraries, but more importantly, it points to the impact of library leadership in influencing whether or not workers can achieve engagement. It's all about creating the right culture and leaders do make a difference either way. Marn acknowledges in his article that his methodology, and which is similar to the one used by Kendrick, is based primarily on finding respondents by casting a large net out to library listeners and that this can definitely attract those who already feel disengaged when they're asked to participate in a survey like this. So you may get some skewed results, but I'd like to say, are we willing to settle for 10% dysfunctional leaders, 20%, 30%? I mean, we should be working to elevate the quality of our leadership. So we're doing everything possible to improve workplace morale and engagement and it must start at the top. So if you have gone to the slido.com, you can see that uh, there's a poll and you can, we'll take about 30 seconds to see what you're feeling today. And thanks for your comments. I can't see the whole thing, but looks like we're getting some good comments there. I can see we have 189 people currently logged into this session. So uh, we'll see how many of those can, there's no limit on the number of people that can take this poll. So one thing I'm seeing is that uh, the vast majority of you or you know, not vast, but certainly so far, uh, well, it looks like we're in a tie now with uh, look forward and less excited and a couple that are looking for a new job and they'll look and no longer uh, look forward. So that is certainly uh, when you read the literature of engagement in the, in the workplace, uh, that is a, sort of something that people will discuss. You know, are people looking forward to going to work? Are they, are they still engaged by the work that they do? All right, thanks for taking the poll. We'll have uh, some, some more polls for you later on. The second of the three things I wanna cover are the three core areas of human leadership. Now, the first of the three areas I wanna discuss relates to the challenge of change in our organizations. And I think that's where a lot of our leadership fails. Uh, one area where lots of damage is done is any kind of change situation, poorly handled, with too little communication and opportunity for staff participation, leaders lose trust and it causes demoralization when they either introduce change in Epley or fail to be open to change ideas that come from library workers. We need to bring forth a whole new and more human approach in which library workers and their leaders adopt a change ready mindset so that we're in a space where we're well equipped to deal with change on an as needed and continuous basis so that it doesn't become a foundation for dysfunction. I mean, you can look at change as no longer being a series of static one-off situations. We now are in a state of perpetual uncertainty that comes 
at us faster and more frequently. So leaders need to approach change in a radically different way and rethink how to get beyond either doing nothing, resisting it, or conducting anxiety-inducing change management projects. The second of the three core areas is power. Leaders have power, and that can be a dangerous thing if it's wielded poorly or with bad intent. When a leader uses their position power to force change on workers, change will happen, but the cascading consequences are likely to A, create little support for the change, and B, contribute to low morale as workers feel powerless and having no control over their workplace responsibilities and how they do that work. This is what we refer to as old power. It is held by few and is closed, inaccessible, and leader-driven. It is a, a form, to some extent, of the old command and control leadership in which leaders enforce rules designed to control workers and their independent thinking. I urge leaders to adopt new power over old power. New power is human-driven, not leader-driven. It is open, participatory, and peer-driven. The goal with new power is not to hoard power, but to channel it and use it to engage library workers and colleagues in determining to the extent possible their own destiny and determining how their work is accomplished. The third of the three areas is the need for leaders to adopt a self-aware and empathic approach to leadership. If I had to point to any one or two things that I think are great failings of leaders, uh, this, this is it. Lack of self-awareness with a related issue of cognitive bias is where leaders may be thinking they're doing a great job, but that they're failing to see that it's anything but that. Now, it could be a total lack of self-awareness that's totally toxic or dysfunctional, or perhaps it's just in one area, such as when a leader gives off intimidating vibes, but thinks that they're approachable and open when the workers don't feel like that's what's happening. And if you aren't self-aware, then you may fail to realize the importance of empathy and connecting with workers and making them feel respected and cared for. Much has been said about empathy and delivering services and understanding the needs of library customers, but leadership empathy starts with understanding workplace issues from the perspective of the worker. Leaders must start with the proposition that if their workers and colleagues are unhappy, disgruntled, and disengaged, it's going to have a direct impact on the quality of the service they provide every day in each customer connection and at every touch point. So our next poll question, and your poll should now be on your screen or your phone if you did log in. And how would you, what do you think would contribute most to better leadership of the three core areas of human leadership, which one do you think would be most important for leaders to adopt and be better at? Uh, and Claire, uh, the, um, if you're referring to the first two points, one was adopting a change readiness mindset, and the second was about power and old power versus new power. This whole session is being recorded, so um, if you miss something, uh, you should be able to catch up with it at a later date. And so far, and I'm not surprised uh, that, you know, in a, in, a, in a library conference about human leadership, about being more human and self, soft skills, that you're suggesting that greater self-awareness and empathy are the most important because they are critical self-skills for leaders. So I want to finish up for, with uh, actually five soft skills. And I... I think these are things that are applicable to leaders at any level and with any number of years of experience where you can improve and adapt these for the benefit of the workplace. Now, again, uh, these are not the only soft skills. There are many, uh, as Michael mentioned in the beginning, things like curiosity and creativity. They're all important, but I wanted to focus on a couple that were foremost on my mind and I'm sure you have your own top five as well. And maybe some of them are gonna be in the five that I share in the next couple minutes. One of the things I discovered in being more self-aware as a leader, and that's something I'm constantly working on because I know that's been a weakness where I have to improve my strength, is that I talk too much and I didn't listen enough. Now, it is definitely human nature to wanna to tell everyone else what we think, what's on our mind, and we even start composing our responses to what anyone else is saying before they even finish saying it. 
So this is a really challenging behavior to overcome, but I think it can be done. It takes committing to the change and practicing it and being kind to yourself if you don't get it right. One thing you might try is asking questions instead of jumping to what you think. Great leaders are curious at heart and want to know more. So for example, let's say you are having, you're working with a staff member and they do want to share a, a new idea. You could ask a simple question such as, why are you interested in giving this new idea a try rather than immediately pontificating on what you think about that idea? You know, a change like that could really make a difference. Leaders, please know that the library workers you lead want your feedback and not just once a year during a performance evaluation. So consider giving regular feedback and when you do be specific about what needs to improve or change. And know that communicating feedback requires good listening so it goes hand in hand with that prior soft skill. And commuting positive feedback, not just negative feedback, is just as important and I think many of you already know that. What about two-way feedback? Library workers may be hesitant to give critical feedback to their manager or leader owing to the power imbalance in the relationship. I think if we can build human connections between leaders and those they lead, then feedback could become more of a two-way conversation and become more easy for all of us. It is human to nurture. Why do librarians want to lead in the first place? I hope it is because they have a big vision for how the library can deliver great services and resources to the people in their community. But no leader can get there alone. They must influence their library colleagues to believe in that vision, but not just believe in it, but obtain the skills to deliver on it. That requires human leaders to invest in staff professional development. And there are too many reasons for a leader to simply put this off or ignore it. They could say, well, there's too little money. There's too little time oh, my staff are disinterested. Or when leaders think they know how to do everyone else's job and they micromanage their work, that's very toxic behavior. Human leaders do look for reasons to support growth through professional development. They do not kill it. Now, you do know that library presentations that feature a cat get much better ratings than the ones that don't, right? That is a fact. You also know that cats are naturally good at being flexible, which is a great model for library leaders. Leaders work with people. Those people are the library's most valuable resource. People have complicated lives. People have emotions. People need support. And it gets back to the third of the three core areas, self-awareness and empathy. Human leaders recognize that people are going to have situations, and this includes the people who use our libraries as well, and that it's up to leaders to internalize and practice flexibility. Yeah, there are absolutely some workplace rules that leaders and managers are going to have to maintain, but rigidly applying those rules without any flexibility is a surefire way to foster low morale. Look, does being a human leader mean you have to be completely laissez-faire where anything goes in the workplace? That you give in to every worker request? That you always say yes? Of course not. And I don't think workers want that either. Doing any of those things in excess is just as problematic as toxic leadership. Workers often want their leaders to establish boundaries, to offer critical feedback, to provide oversight, but in a rational and respectful way. Human leaders practice fairness, common sense and seek balance in how they lead and use power. We should seek to avoid an unhealthy imbalance in all things. But be mindful of your leadership styles and apply them when and as needed for the appropriate situations. Sometimes you need to be hands off. Sometimes you need to be autocratic and most times somewhere in between those two ends of the spectrum. Being a human leader means you bring balance to your work and to your philosophy of leadership. So we have, and I love what Julia said. She said, I cannot believe the words you are speaking that I never hear at work. And I'm sorry that you don't. And I hope that you will take what happened here today and share that with your leaders. And I like Marie's comment. And by the way, Marie, uh, Breen Brown, there's a great article by Jason Martin in the latest issue of College and Research Library News about why it's so important to read about Breen, Breen Brown. And, the, and that our, a journal is uh, an, a free, an open online journal. 
Okay, and I, I will try to, if I'm gonna wrap up and we'll see if we have a moment to get on new power, but while people are taking the poll, again, uh, as I said, new power, sort of the opposite of old power, where uh, my description of it was, new power is human driven, not leader driven. It is open, participatory and peer driven. And it takes special leaders, I think, to make that. And the free journal was, College and Research Library News. That's where Jason Martin had a great article about Breen Brown, if you want to read more about Breen Brown. Well, I hope that we can get the library leaders who need to hear this to get to hear the session. All right, so I did ask which of the soft skills you thought contributed the most to human leadership. And I really like your response there, helping others grow. Um, yeah, that is something that is human and heartful. And uh, I think we have to try to do more to help our staff and our workers and our colleagues have access to professional development. And there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. And just like uh, librarians always do in chats, thank you, Cecilia, for going out and getting the link to the article. Thank you so much. But uh, again, uh, yeah, these others are, are pretty important too. And I wish, uh, I'm surprised that Give Meaningful Feedback came in, you know, kind of last in that poll, but thanks for participating. It's interesting something to think about. All right, so finishing up with just a couple of uh, next steps, I want you to get to your next sessions. Now, I've made a number of suggestions for you to be a better leader who will truly influence followers to be inspired by your leadership because I and mean, that's what it's really all about. But where do you start? So here are my thoughts on your next steps for practicing human leadership. Take the idea of human leadership to heart or bring it to the attention of the leaders who should be here that aren't hearing what they need to hear. Are you creating the workplace where people want to be? If you're not sure, check your self-awareness. Ask what you're missing. Are you asking your colleagues what you can do to be a better leader? Or might you consider seeking the support of a leadership mentor? I started my library journal column with one focus in mind. How can I become a leader who is continuously learning and helping others to do the same? Few of us are born great, let alone good leaders. If you're not committed to constantly learning to be a better leader, maybe you shouldn't be leading anyone. To become a better learner and a better leader, you need to think about your strengths and weaknesses and how to keep honing your skills to minimize the weaknesses and build your strengths. Self-reflection, even just spending five or 10 minutes at the end of the day, Reflecting on your conversations or your decisions and asking how you can do better next time is a way to grasp the value of being a reflective leader who will grow more human through that reflection. Finally, change is hard for everyone, people as well as organizations. And whether it's changing yourself or that organization, it's tough. But to become a better, more human leader, you need to focus on yourself then you'll help your organization. So just identify one small thing you can do to start. So I offer an example on the screen there, or you could add one leadership reading source to your daily practice, such as, uh, I'd like smart brief on leadership. It's a digest of leadership ideas and articles. And just reading one inspirational thing per day can really be helpful to me as a leader. It's just one small change that you can do to get better at your leadership and ultimately have higher more impactful change. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you on how and why library leaders are failing, but more importantly, what we can do about it. And if we can agree that there is a problem with library leadership, and I think I saw some of that in the chat today, and it needs to improve, then our solutions start with each of us making a commitment to human leadership. So thank you for listening and for your engagement, and I wish you the best on your quest to practice human leadership. And Shah, if you want to come in now, if you, if I, I did see there were a couple of questions. Because now the chat is rolling forward. Okay, uh, let's see. And I think a lot of folks who pretended today gave really uh, great advice to others at about leadership ideas and what works for them. So I really appreciate everyone for sharing their positive thoughts today in the session. I'm gonna turn off, uh, do we have any questions, Shaw, or anything? I know there was a question about what is new power versus old power. Thank you too. I'm glad to hear it made your day. 
But it sounds like people are moving on to the next session. I can see that participants are dropping out. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm at bells, B-E-L-L-S, at temple.edu. Uh, so Aaron asks, so new powers interpersonal? Yes, I would say very much so. But sometimes it might be hands off and having trust in those you work with to get what that needs to be done with their own insight and, their, and doing it in the way that they think it should be done. So sometimes you might be hand off in a new power situation. Thanks, Aaron, for your question. And I do have a, a library journal column about new power and old power. You can look that up too. Uh, Katie's asking, do you think the corporatization of libraries is a factor in widespread low morale? Uh, you know, that's a, I don't know. I think we have to talk a little bit more about what do we mean by the corporatization of libraries? Uh, that might be where the problem actually starts. And so, yeah, if people feel like they're working more in a corporate environment where if, the, if a corporation isn't letting people have a say in how things are done, um, that could certainly be demoralizing. And Bethany has a, a question about uh, taking responsibility and leadership. Well, I think part of the, t I mean, obviously, if you're a leader and if you've decided to lead, then yeah, you obviously have to be in a position to take responsibility for what's happening in your organization. And if you see dysfunction, uh, you need to ask yourself what you can do to help improve that situation. Yeah, hopefully we'll have opportunities to talk about this more. And it's just, as I said, something that's real concerning. And I think we just have to do better. And we'll figure out, have to figure out ways to do that together. So thanks, everyone. I will be ending the recording now.